you to turn your mobile phones off because we're running the speaker from Bluetooth and if you're not careful your phones will be trying to speak to the speaker and everything will go horribly wrong. So if you would do that that'd be very good. Good afternoon. My name is Ros Curtis. I'm a humanist celebrant and Kate was my friend. Before we begin you might be asking why we're calling this a celebration when we all feel bereft at the loss of our beloved friend and not at all like celebrating anything. Well, it's because today we must try to put aside our feelings of loss and grief. We have the rest of our lives to indulge in those. Today we're all together in one place to share our good fortune in knowing Kate and being a part of her life. A few years ago I was telling Kate about a funeral over which I'd presided that was approvingly described at the time by the family concerned as a comedy funeral. It had been highly unconventional, full of off-the-wall silliness and carefully planned detail. We listened to the retelling of hilarious family stories, joined in with the family jokes, shared some favourite anecdotes and pretty much everybody laughed till they cried. She absolutely loved the whole idea and made me promise that I would do the same for her. I told her that if it came to it, it wouldn't be funny. But we were both amused by the absurdity of her request, given that she was younger than me and in better health at the time. I can't believe I'm here. Mm. I can't believe I'm doing this. No. I, I can't believe she's gone. But I have to do this because she made me promise. So bear with me mm. if I wobble a bit here and there. Mm. We all now belong to a closed group of those who are able to call Kate Percival friend. Looking around, I think we can see how diverse a group that is. I'm pretty sure that many of you don't even know each other. And that's because Kate made friends wherever she went. But they were discreet and separate friendship groups. She was the point of connection, which is why we're all here today. Some of you knew her from her youth or her school days. Some as colleagues or pupils from her days as a teacher. Some as a quilter, a gardener, a builder, a nurse or a neighbour, and some simply because she made friends with people as she went about her daily life. But it is wonderful to see you all, however you came to know Kate, and I know how thrilled she'd be that so many of you are here today. I must also say that in spite of my own beliefs, I'm still vaguely half expecting her to critique my performance today. <laughs> as we all know, she did like to be in charge. <laughs> not going to appear. She's gone, 
and we who are left are gathered here to remember her with laughter, I hope, as well as tears, to relive some memories and together weave the last strands of her richly varied and colourful years so that we can look clearly at the whole of the tapestry that was her life. Kate asked me at the outset to make my own views clear because we broadly shared the same outlook on life. I'm a celebrant member of Humanists UK. Kate was, she felt, a humanist in the widest sense, though not a signed up member. Humanism's a simple philosophy, makes its sense of the world using reason, experience, compassion and our common humanity. Amongst other things, we believe that it's entirely possible to lead, lead a good life without religion. But I hope we can agree that as humans we share much whatever our systems of belief. And so, here today, those of all faiths and of none are very welcome. I've written over the years many hundreds of ceremonies. And I must confess that I often find myself using many of the same phrases and sentences as I write, not through laziness, but because once you've found a good way to say something difficult, it seems unnecessary to try and say it a different way each time. Hence, repetition. But every now and again a ceremony presents itself in which I find I need to alter what I say. The thing is this, platitudes, however well meant or comforting they may be, won't do for Kate. Nor for that matter would the sort of euphemisms she would have consigned to the rubbish bin as sentimental twaddle. <laughs> Whenever it happens, whatever the circumstances, whether we feel we can fall into the comfortable arms of faith or not, the question is the same for all of us. What are we to do with death? How are we to face it, either for ourselves or in others? I have no belief in an afterlife, and Kate didn't either, unless it's possibly the Q continuum. It's a joke for Trekkies. <laughs> But I do believe that death is necessary, and that a world without it will be impossible. For death doesn't end life, but is part of it, one of nature's many transformations as we work our way through its cycles. These are the words of W.B. Yeats. Death informs life. It's not simply the mother of beauty, it's the mother of life itself. For how could we conceive of life if there were no death? And it's only because we conceive of life that we know we must taste it, lingeringly, try every flavour and nuance, drink in experience while we can. Death and life are dependent upon each other like order and chaos, neither concept being possible without the other. So there should be no fear of death, which is omnipresent, part of life. Welcome it into your arms, for it is but rest. For you lie in nature, like a heartbeat. Kate wasn't a great one for poetry, but her daughter Ellen gave her a small book at Christmas called Sometimes a Wild God. The writer, Tom Hirons, commented that poetry is a form of magic and don't let anyone tell you anything different. And Ellen wanted it included. So when Mum was uh, specifying what she did and didn't want at the funeral, she said that there was to, there was to be absolutely no God. Um, <laughs> but I got the feeling that she probably meant a kind of capital G God. And if the if she, from my understanding of Mum's feelings about that kind of thing, I think if she was to sort of have a feeling towards a kind of God, it would be a God like this. Also, on the note of the Q continuum, I suspect the Q in Mum's last Facebook post was just a uh, mistype because Q is her most hated Star Trek character of all time, and as we all know, she did love to hate. So. <laughs> Continuum, so yeah, not if she, oh, if she was eternally in the presence of Q, she'd. Oh. <laughs> Sometimes a wild god comes to the table. He is awkward and does not know the ways of porcelain, of fork, and mustard, and silver. His voice makes vinegar from wine. When the wild god arrives at the door, you will probably fear him. He reminds you of something dark that you might have dreamt, 
or the secret you do not wish to be shared. He will not ring the doorbell. Instead, he scrapes with his fingers, leaving blood on the paintwork, though primroses grow in circles round his feet. You do not want to let him in. You are very busy. It is late or early, and besides, you cannot look at him straight because he makes you want to cry. The dog barks. The wild god smiles. He holds out his hand. The dog licks his wounds and leads him inside. The wild god stands in your kitchen. Ivy is taking over your sideboard. Mistletoe has moved into the lampshades and wrens have begun to sing an old song in the mouth of your kettle. I haven't much, you say, and give him the worst of your food. He sits at the table, bleeding. He coughs up foxes. There are otters in his eyes. When your wife calls down, you close the door and tell her it's fine. You will not let her see the strange guest at your table. The wild god asks for whiskey, and you pour a glass for him, then a glass for yourself. Three snakes are beginning to nest in your voice box. You cough. Oh, limitless space. Oh, eternal mystery. Oh, endless cycles, death and birth. Oh, miracle of life. Oh, the wondrous dance of it all. You cough again. Expectorate the snakes and water down the whiskey, wondering how you got so old and where your passion went. <laughs> the wild god reaches into a bag made of moles and nightingale skin. He pulls out a two-reeded pipe, raises an eyebrow, and all the birds begin to sing. The fox leaps into your eyes. Otters rush from the darkness. The snakes pour through your body. Your dog howls, and upstairs your wife both exults and weeps at once. The wild god dances with your dog. You dance with the sparrows. A white stag pulls up a stool and bellows hymns to enchantments. A pelican leaps from chair to chair. In the distance, warriors pour from their tombs. <laughs> Slow down. Ancient gold grows like grass in the fields. Everyone dreams the words to long forgotten songs. The hills echo and the grey stones ring with laughter and madness and pain. In the middle of the dance, the house takes off from the ground. Clouds climb through the windows. Lightning pounds its fists on the table. The moon leans in through the window. The wild god points to your side. You are bleeding heavily. You've been bleeding for a long time, possibly since you were born. There is a bear in the wound. Why did you leave me to die? Asked the wild god. And you say, I was busy surviving. The shops were all closed. I didn't know how. I'm sorry. Listen to them. The fox in your neck and the snakes in your arms and the wren and the sparrow and the deer. The great unnameable beasts in your liver and your kidneys and your heart. There is a symphony of howling, a cacophony of dissent. The wild god nods his head and you wake on the floor holding a knife, a bottle and a handful of black fur. Your dog is asleep on the table. Your wife is stirring far above. Your cheeks are wet with tears. Your mouth aches from laughter or shouting. A black bear is sitting by the fire. Sometimes a wild god comes to the table. He is awkward and does not know the ways of porcelain, of fork and mustard and silver. His voice makes vinegar from wine and brings the dead to life. You know what? I think she deserves a round of applause. <laughs> you did that beautifully. Conventionally, at the centre of a funeral, is a eulogy. But Kate was anything but conventional, mm -hmm. so this ceremony isn't either. We do, however, have a number of prepared contributions, and there are, of course, other contributions to be found in the fantastic order of service. Or is it possibly a match programme? <laughs> <laughs> or a fancy. 
and it's been put together for us by ex-pupil Justin Swarbrick. Has he actually arrived yet? No. <laughs> There's a surprise. Uh, who introduced Martin to Kate so many years ago. If there is time, I shall also throw the floor open for any further brief contributions. And we're going to hear first from Sandy Lockwood, who will be followed by Nigel Scheinwald, and John Hamer, and Marion McCrindle. Thank you very much. My name is Sandy Lockhart, and I go back to... Uh, very early days with Kate, I was the neighbour of the teachers in Elmsley Avenue. And our relative peace was disturbed and it's never been the same since 1954 with the arrival of Kate Finch. <laughs> and uh, I lived next door to this wonderful family, Norman, Betty, Sue and Kate, and I've remembered them with great memories for a long time. I only have two things I'd like to say about Kate. Uh, First is, she always used to steal my Beano comics. <laughs> I don't know whether this was because Norman, who was quite a stern figure, wouldn't allow her to have them, but she would borrow them and they would never come back. <laughs> the second memory I have uh, is, it's a little bit macabre. I, I remember walking in the pram with, with Betty and Kate in one of those classic four-wheel prams in a little park next to, next to where we lived, and I must have been about seven or eight years old. And I wanted to know if I pushed the car, the pram, quickly and then put the brakes on, whether it would cause skid marks in the road. <laughs> well, I trotted down the road and I applied the brakes and it didn't produce skid marks, but the, the pram went ass over tea kettle. <laughs> Kate bounced off and landed in a heap on the ground. I don't know who was more disturbed, Betty, Kate or myself. Uh, fortunately, she, she recovered and survived that dreadful incident. And I'm wondering if the trauma of hitting the, the ground added to her creative life, which we all know is quite, quite extraordinary. So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, Kate was a wonderful friend. I'm only sorry that, because I live so far away, I lost touch, but it's great to be here today. Thank you. Michael Scheinwald. I'm one of uh, quite a few people um, here today who are school friends uh, of Kate um, and who can count on her as a friend over 50 years. Now for the boys amongst us, we got to know Kate through Convergence, which was the joint dramatic society of the Harrow County Girls and Boys Schools. And of course Convergence, <laughs> Convergence is what most teenagers dream of. Um, <laughs> And I think we discovered later that uh, the two teachers who founded this were engaged in quite a bit of convergence themselves. <laughs> anyway, convergence was a success and it channeled uh, Kate's very strong interest in drama. In, she acted in play, she was involved behind the scenes as a props mistress and production manager, and she went to see a lot of plays outside school. She was a very good and very versatile actress, and I had the good fortune to direct her in two very contrasting roles. Queen Gertrude uh, in Hamlet, um, and Mrs. Drudge, the <laughs> knowing charlady uh, in the Agatha Christie play within the play in Tom Stoppard's Real Inspector Howe. Now, they were very different roles, but Katie was, of course, brilliant in both. Um, but it wasn't just the plays. The Finch family and their home became a fixed point for our sixth form social lives. Northwick Circle was a very comfortable open house, part salon, part gathering point, which occasionally descended into party central. Um, not maybe Studio 64, but um, we tried. We stayed in close touch with the family after they moved to uh, Chichester. The adult case that everyone here remembers uh, was very recognisable from the schoolgirl Kate we met 50 years ago. She was into all forms of music and art. She had very wide taste. She had very strong views. She was very independent-minded. Going against uh, all societal trends, she was also wonderful at making things that we couldn't do. Clothes, costumes, furnishings, painting sketches, whatever. She consumed and mastered all arts and crafts, and no surprise either, that she became a wonderful teacher, one her students remember for decades afterwards, or that she was a hugely knowledgeable gardener and lover of the great outdoors, or that humour and self-deprecation would be characteristics for life. So much we could have guessed then, 
but there was a lot that we couldn't have guessed. It always surprised me, and it sounds funny to say it, it always surprised me how much Kate actually knew, and on such a wide waterfront. If you went to an exhibition with her, she'd give you a masterclass, not just on the art and the artist, but the, life's, the, li the life and the loves of the artist, the history, the type of society in that century or this century. She had extremely eclectic tastes. And we all knew then that she loved music, but I think ending up with two jukeboxes in your kitchen was, was probably not predictable. She became also quite a political animal. She was very, very well informed, with scathing views on more or less every political figure that I can think of. She was trenchant and unforgiving and hilarious. And nor could we have been certain that Kate would be the thoughtful, loyal, communicative and interested friend decade after decade that she was, uh, despite the fact that she and her friends were moving around. She kept in touch with more people from our school uh, than we did, and she had, as Ros has said, a large number of mostly separate but occasionally concentric circles of friends, the group from Harrow, people from her teaching days, her music friends, heritage friends, quilting friends, and so on. And finally, and most importantly, we might not have guessed that Kate would so happily form her own family with Martin and Ellen, the centre of her life which gave her so much pride and pleasure. All of us who knew Kate way back then send our condolences to Martin, to Martin and Ellen in particular and to Suzanne, who is the last Finch standing of the Northwick Circle Group. Um, it, I hope it's of some small consolation to you that Kate was loved and admired by her friends as a complete original, one of the funniest, warmest and creative people you will ever know. Thank you. Now introduce to you Master Hamer, who is wearing, you might notice, his school tie. <laughs> um, so my name is uh, John Hamer, and uh, I knew Kate originally as Miss Finch. And she was my art teacher at John Hamden Grammar School in High Wycombe. I met her in 1992, and it's a great honour to be asked to speak here today. In fact, this is probably the only bit of homework I've ever got into this speech. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> <That's true. laughs> the best way to describe her back then was that she was a character. <laughs> At the time, I felt that she was maybe a little eccentric, but as a teacher now myself, I can appreciate that actually what she had was a real passion, a real passion for both her students and to her school. She was certainly memorable, and encouraged her classes and her students to develop their creativity by playing to their strengths. Whenever anyone said, I can't do this, she showed them a way that they could. I simply liked her because she was funny and occasionally rude. <laughs> now, many years later, I was working for John Lewis Department Store when I literally stopped in my tracks and I heard a booming, Master Hamer, <laughs> echoing down one of the aisles. I turned and I saw Kate with a mischievous grin and I was flattered that she remembered me. Kate spoke to me like we were old friends, and then, and I'm sorry to say this, Martin, we took it one step further and became Facebook friends <laughs> a few years later. Kate and Martin, they moved from Marlow down south, where I am now living. I'd like to think this is so that she could be closer to me, but I don't think that's really the reason. <laughs> I enjoyed my time with Kate. She came to watch my boy play football in Stubbington. We spoke about superhero films and Star Wars, and we reminisced about days at Hamden. I wish I'd spent more time with Kate once she'd moved here. In June this year, Kate contacted me to tell me that her condition had regrettably worsened, and, she was, and it was laughing at the treatments that she'd been given. She knew that she didn't have long left at this point, and she wanted greatly to do something with her stockpiled art and textile supplies that filled her house. She wanted to pass them on to people who would appreciate and use them, and I know that there are several people here today that have received gifts from Kate. She told me that she had a few canvases and materials that she wanted to donate to people at my school. Just a few things. We ended up filling four cars worth. I needed to call the head of textiles with her car to come as well. As Kate became more and more excited as she went through the house at the thought of what students could do with her donations. When our textiles teacher eventually got it to school and saw what Kate had actually given her, she started crying. 
as her students could never normally dream to be able to use some of these materials or tools. The creative arts aren't exactly a priority for the current government, as Kate may have told you in passing. <laughs> it will be a great joy and a pleasure for me to see Kate's donations being used by students at my school over the next few years. The thing that she has, things that she has gifted to us will support students in creating fantastic artwork, beautiful textile pieces, which I know she would have loved to have seen. As Kate no doubtedly, sorry, undoubtedly lives on through all of her designs, through all of her artwork and her quilts that she poured her heart and soul into, she will now also be living on in the designs, the artwork and the creations of generations of students to come. We never know how much and how far the reach and influence of our lives will be. With Kate, I have a feeling she's going to be immortal. And lastly, Marion. Just as well we were told to write it down, it would have all gone after today. Sadly, I did not have the pleasure of knowing Kate for as long, nor as well as many of you here. I met her through the Quilters Guild of the British Isles when she was stewarding alongside her modern quilt colleagues at one of the AGMs. I think I got adopted at dinner, being on my normal um, lonesome, and she drew me a design on the back of my place card, which I kept. I don't know why it was called Spiced Koala. I have no idea if that has any significance, but, you know... And then when I went down to see her at one of her many wakes, gosh, I was scared to go, um, she very kindly sent me some silks. So I thought the least I could do would be to make up a design. So, sorry, Kate, it's, it's sort of like the best I could do, but it's your fault if you don't like it. <laughs> it was at the end of the following Festival of Quilts, which is something we have in the Guild in, well, we promote in the Guild in Birmingham each year, that she came to me with a proposal. Traditionally, the four exhibiting groups of the Guild show their work separately, you know, walls, barriers. But Kate's idea was that we should have an exhibition where all the five Guild groups should work together. The research and study group would choose a quilt, and the other groups, traditional, modern, miniature and contemporary, would then make a quilt in response to that quilt. All five groups would then put on a cohesive exhibition at Festival of Quilts 2019. Some of the emails were quite amusing, as certain people tried to stamp their authority, their authority, on Kate's venture. <laughs> Kate told them, increasingly directly, shall we say, where they could go. <laughs> now, at the time, I was vice president of the Guild, so I had to be, you know, a little bit that. Well, if ever. And I'm sitting on the sidelines going, yeah, go for it. Because some of the ladies were uh, quite determined in their views. However, we have held to Kate's original vision. And the gallery next year, 2019, will be a key part of the festival, the Guild's 40th year. We shall be 